Good morning. Um, read, let's stand for a reading from the scriptures. It's from Psalm 32, 1 and 11. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. Let's pray this morning to get us started off the very best way possible. Father, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will help each one of us to just calm our hearts, calm our spirits. Help us, Lord, to uh, look to you this morning and just help us, Lord, to praise you in everything that we do and say. Open our hearts, open our minds to the words that you would have us here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. story of the foolish man and the wise man this morning. Is your house built on the rock or is it built on the things of this world on the sand? The moral of that story is if you build your house on the rock, that doesn't mean the rain's not coming. It's coming. <laughs> There's going to be things. But if you're built on God, if you're built on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can weather those storms. You can get through them. It's not going to be peaches and cream. But he's going to be with you. If you build your house on the sand, if you build your house on the things of the world, your hopes, your dreams, other people, your talents, if you build your life on those, guess what happens when the storms come? In the song, it says, it went splat. And that's what happens. God is the foundation 
then we need to build our lives on. If your life is not built on the foundation of God, Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for you. I want you to have what I have. Have Jesus. Seek him. Seek his face. Ask him to live with you. Build your house. Build your life on him. present here with us and that you have a word for us for this day. So Lord, I just pray that we would be able to, to open the eyes of our heart as we have sung this morning, that we might see and that we might hear your word, your word of encouragement, your word of comfort, your word of challenge, Lord, as we go forth into the world to be your light, to be your salt. And I just pray, God, that you would be with us. Lord, there are concerns that are on our hearts and we just lift those to you right now. Each and every one of us have our own concerns. Lord, we also have uh, mutual concerns as we think of the things that are going on in our world. And I just pray, God, that you, the God of the universe, the God who is in control, would hear our prayers and that you would answer. Father, we just again thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for your presence here with us. We thank you for who you are. 
filled with grace and mercy and love and forgiveness and, and so much more, Lord, that we, we can't even imagine. So we praise you and we honor you. And for it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. As we prepare to take up our Diamond Day missions offering, let me just tell you that I um, got a message from Pastor Solomon this week saying that uh, they were having troubles with the water system at the uh, children's home. And it wasn't so much that they were having issues. It sounds like the government and the city were having issues getting proper water to them. And so he asked if we could help him out by purchasing the required materials and a pump in order to pump fresh water. He said he found a water source. I don't know where he found it for the children's home, but he said he found a fresh water source and that he needed uh, about a thousand dollars to get, make it happen. Well, we, because of you uh, here at the church have that much available in our fund for Honduras. And so I was able to say yes. And then the next day I was able to send that a thousand dollars and and so they've received it, and whether he's got it in place yet or not, he will, I'm sure, within this next week, <laughs> have it in place. And so I just wanted to let you know that, that your ties, your offerings, your gifts to the children's home and to the ministry of Pastor Solomon and Anita are, are doing good work and uh, providing for their needs, and both physically, spiritually, emotionally, and, and uh, I just, you just needed to hear that. And it, uh, it would have been easy for that to run underneath the radar and, and not you not know, but I wanted you to know how that was going on. So, with that said, let's take up our Diamond Day missions offering. All the monies that are received do go to our missions. Friends in Honduras. Children can go get their containers. Also, if you uh, drove by the church yesterday, uh, probably from noon to four o'clock or so, you saw all kinds of cars here. There was a memorial service for no one from our congregation. In fact, uh, I didn't know the gentleman for whom the service was for, uh, but it was a family member of someone who lives in our neighborhood, and they were looking for a, a venue, and I offered up our church, obviously, and they took us up on it. and. Uh, 
Right, and the family has uh, been a part of our preschool in the past and so knew about us and, and so they felt fairly welcome here. And, and so that's why, and there was probably a hundred or so folks here for that. And uh, we just, it's another outreach of our, of our church. And so I just wanted you to know about that as well. Offers, offering plate is at the back. If you have a tithe and an offering, you can place it in there. You can use the Givelify app all kinds of ways of getting your tithes and offerings to the church. Uh, we're four Sundays away from Easter, counting down to Easter, which means we're three Sundays away from the Palm Sunday celebration. And we have a great contingent of children that are here worshiping with us these days. And so you want... Okay, so make sure that all of you kids are here in three Sundays... Palm Sunday, April 10, to participate in and to celebrate Palm Sunday with the palm branches. And I think Jesus might even show up in the flesh. Yeah. And uh, we, it just, uh, it's uh, just a great time of, of celebration. Uh, so, and the kids will be doing the announcements and the prayers and uh, leading their praise and worship and playing guitar and... <laughs> All right. Children are dismissed to go to junior church at this time. I tell you what, it is fun to watch them, uh, kids taking up the ties, uh, taking up the diamond day. Uh, did you see Logan? He sprinted over to get his container. I mean, he sprinted, about stepped on Abby's toes, and and uh, man, I tell you what, <laughs> if we all were that excited to give our talents and our resources to the Lord, that'd be great. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark 13. Mark 13. Mark 13, going to look at the first 11 verses of Mark chapter 13. This is a fascinating and crucial chapter, Mark 13 is, here in the Gospel of Mark. It's fascinating because of its subject matter, but it's also a crucial portion of Scripture because of its role in Mark's writings. It's a transition ver uh, chapter between the description of Jesus' teachings that have been emphasized in chapter 12... And immediately preceding the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, which actually takes about a fourth of the book of Mark. So it's very, very important. This chapter is important. And in it, Jesus addresses some major concerns of his followers. Major concerns of his followers and major concerns of ours. It's going to address specifically some of their concerns but more in a general way, some of ours. So as we begin today, and we're going to read these passages of Scripture, uh, verse, of, verse 11 verses, let me ask you the question, what is it that you're concerned with? What is it that you're concerned about in your world or in our world? Are you concerned about the state of our country? Probably should be. Are you concerned about the war in Ukraine? Probably should be. What about gas prices? That concern you? Prices in the grocery store? That concern you? Price of diesel? Excuse me, not just gas, diesel as well. Yeah. Uh, what about health issues? Is that a concern of yours? Relationship troubles? Financial reversals? Why the Cowboys traded Amari Cooper? Are all these concerns that you might have? <laughs> Well, notice the concerns that we have in the first four verses of Mark 13. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of the disciples said, Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. Other translations use other descriptive words uh, for magnificent buildings. Look at how impressive the stones in the walls are. Jesus replied, verse 2, Yes, Look at these great buildings, but they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of the other. 
It's kind of interesting, right? Verse 3, later Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives across the valley from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him privately and said, Tell us when this will happen. I, I just imagine. They've gone now from looking closely at the buildings as leaving the temple, and they've gone over to a, a hillside where they're looking down at the valley and then back up at the temple. And I, can you imagine the time... You know, there's a little time gap here in the scriptures. Don't you think they had been talking about this among themselves all the way over to this place where Jesus now has set them down on the Mount of Olives across the valley? And so they come to him and they say, when's this going to happen? I mean, they've been talking about it among themselves. What's he talking about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what sign will show us when this will be fulfilled? As Jesus and his disciples were walking out of the magnificent temple, this fabulously built temple, they come to him and say, look at it. Look how massive it is. The, the, I mean, they've been admiring the architecture. They've been admiring the, the grandeur. They, and, and well, they should be. It was a magnificent place. I mean, I know some of you have seen some really magnificent buildings uh, churches, mosques, castles, fortresses. But few of them in the world would compare to Herod's temple. It was truly a wonder of the world of his day. And so they're admiring this amazing place. And then Jesus says, yeah, you see how great it is? Well, it's going to be completely destroyed. And they're going, how can that be? It's so beautiful. It's so magnificently built. It's, it, it's going to last forever. Before 9-11, would we have ever thought that the World Trade Center would be reduced to rubble? No. No. What is even more incredible is the statement of what Jesus says. Not just that they're looking at these buildings, but what Jesus says. Jesus spoke these words in 30 or so A.D. Okay? Jesus said these words in 30 or so A.D. And then in 66 A.D., war broke out between the Jews and the Roman Empire. And it came to a climax in 70 A.D., just 40 years after Jesus had said this. And Rome completely destroys Herod's temple leveling it to the ground. Not one stone left on top of another. In fact, if you read the words of Josephus, Josephus was a Jewish historian, not a Christian, but a Jewish historian of the day who lived through the world war, and he actually used the words of Jesus in describing what had happened. The secular Jewish historian. Truth be told, we should make a bigger deal of this than we do. Because this was huge. This was, hear me, this was a tremendous validation of Jesus and the New Testament. Jesus said it. It happened. That validates what he said. That validates all that he said. That validates all that he is. So when the disciples heard this, this startling prediction, this prophecy, they immediately wanted to know what, when this was going to happen. What's the signs? What's the clues? What are the, what's going to happen before these things, in quotes, these things happen? Referring to the destruction of the temple. Well, Jesus answers them, and he answers us too. And he says, "These here's what's going to happen. Now, you, you have to realize, being Jews, these guys, all his disciples, they were absolutely crazy about the temple. It's an important place in their lives. We talked about this in, in the last few weeks, how important the temple was to all of Jewish life. And for it being completely destroyed was beyond their understanding. And knowing that, it, that in the past their temples had been destroyed, they, they knew that their temples had been destroyed in the past and it was always a judgment of God. 
So they view Jesus' predictions as, as an end of the world event. Hear me? An end of the world event. That's what they were thinking of it as. What's the line from the movie? A, a catastrophe of biblical proportions. <laughs> That's what this was going to be. This was what is for the temple to be destroyed. It was an end of the world event to them. They knew that it would send in motion the end. Interestingly, that's how we often view things, or view this rather. We view this. Many Christians view Jesus's words in Mark thirteen as prophecy of the end of the world, prophecy of end times. And at face value, Jesus seems to be responding to their specific question: How will we know when the temple will be destroyed? An event that apparently was going to happen in seventy A.D. So when he tells them. What they are facing, it applies to us as well because it's not only personal, it's global. Answering them, Jesus answers us. Here's what I mean by that. He gives them and us a spiritual principle for facing disaster, catastrophe, and the end of the world as you know it events. He gives us a principle. All of this will be tied together in a single statement that he makes. Now look at verses 5 through 8. Jesus replied, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in many parts of the world as well as famines. By this, but this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Wow. Okay. So Jesus is saying, don't let anybody deceive you. Don't let anybody mislead you. And then he gives us two categories of things by which not to be misled. First of all is by people. Many are going to come, he said, in my name saying that they're the Messiah, that he has returned. And he says, don't be misled by them. Don't be misled by people who say the end is near. We know from history that they, the disciples, encountered many false messiahs. People sprang up at the end time during this war and the, during the destruction of the temple claiming to be the Messiah and they gathered followers together and they were saying virtually we can do this. This is the end of the world. Sound familiar? Virtually every generation through the last 2,000 years have had people that have claimed to be the chosen one. The chosen one. You'll hear that in movies. The chosen one. The chosen one means Messiah. The anointed one. The chosen one. Mohammed was one of these. Millions of people still pray to Allah because of Mohammed and practice the Islamic faith. Our generation has had its own share not near as influential as Mohammed, but there's the Jim Joneses of the world. And from that we get the don't drink the Kool-Aid. There's the David Koresh's of the world. We still see, those of us my age, still see visions of, of uh, the, the, the compound there near Waco burning as ATF officers are throwing tear gas and and into the windows. It's, it's crazy. People claiming to be the chosen one. Don't be misled by people, Jesus says. I could go into televangelists, but I won't. I can go into... Churches who have the big billboard with the big picture of the pastor on it. But I won't. Second category of not being misled is by world events. Whoa. Don't be misled by world events. 
We might say even by current events. Verse 7, when you hear about wars, rumors of wars, don't panic, don't be alarmed. And I would say underline that. Don't panic. These things will happen, he says, but they are not the end. There's going to be wars. And he goes on to say there's going to be lots of earthquakes. There's going to be lots of famines. But these are world events that will make you think the end is near. But it's been happening for 2,000 years. Granted, we're closer to the end of the world now than they were 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago, and so forth. Yes. But even in the disciples' lifetime, they were thinking that the end of the world was coming while they were alive. You read Paul's writings, and when he's younger, he's thinking, Lord, come. You know, our Lord cometh. Come on, Jesus, let's do this. Later on in his life, he's going, well, maybe I'm not going to be alive for Jesus to come again. But he's coming soon. Here we are 2,000 years later. So again, from history, we've learned that through this, through the years, there's been wars. There's been rumors of war. And every time, I mean, in our own, I mean, just in the last century, in the 20th century, 21st century, we have war after war. We have, as Colonel Potter would say, I fought in the war to end all wars, and then I fought in the war after that. Speaking of World War I, World War II. And then we've had conflict after conflict since then. Folks living in the 30s and 40s really thought the world was about to end. Adolf Hitler had to have been the Antichrist, right? And there's been others since then. When the Gulf War broke out, and we thought, this is it. This is it. This is, a, this is a religious war and political war all wrapped up in one. Armageddon can't be far away. What does Jesus say? Don't worry. Don't worry. What about 22 years ago? What was the big scare 22 years ago? Let's see, we're in 2022. So if you go back, I guess, 23 years, back into 1999. Oh, Y2K. Woo. What's going to happen then? Nothing. <laughs> Don't worry about all this stuff, Jesus says. Don't let it concern you. Don't be misled by world events. It isn't the end. In fact, it's just the beginning. 2,000 years ago, and virtually every century since then, people have been convinced that the world events were foretelling the end of the world. There's been men that have set dates when the end of the world is going to come. And we just go right by them. And what I have always said, if you want to know for sure when Christ isn't coming, it's going to be on those dates. Because he would not give those people the satisfaction of being right. <laughs> Don't be concerned by current events. Notice now he didn't say, he didn't say disaster, catastrophe, the end isn't going to happen. It is. They are. But he says, don't be concerned about him. Why? Because you have more important things to be concerned about. That's what he's saying. You have more important things. There's something far more important for you to be concerned about. Look now at verses 9 through 11. When these things begin to happen, watch out, he says. You will be handed over to the local councils and beat it, beaten in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. Did you get that? You will be mistreated. You will be arrested, turned over to the officials. You will be persecuted. Because you follow Jesus. 
But this is going to be the greatest opportunity in the church for you to tell about me. Verse 10, for the good day, just say what God tells you to say at the time. For it is not you who will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit. All these things, Jesus says, are just the beginning. You must be on your guard. You must watch. You must be alert because persecution is coming. Now, he was speaking to his disciples. And we know through the book of Acts, it came. Was I not hearing that verse read in Sunday school this morning? That started the diaspora? That started the, after these things happened, then the Jews scattered throughout the entire Roman Empire because of the persecution that was started upon the, the Christians. And that dis dispersion of Christians throughout the Roman Empire was the greatest thing that ever happened for the spread of the gospel for the good news of Jesus to be told to every nation. And we're still in the process of telling every nation about this. Book of Acts has plenty of this about it. Mark's readers, those that were actually reading this for the first time, lived under intense persecution from the emperor at the time, Nero. Now, Nero was a really nice guy. When... He would find Christians, he would tar them, not feather them, but tar them and light them on fire so that he would have light in his gardens. But what about us? Is all this happening? Any of this happening today? Yes, in parts of the world it is. Turkey, China, India, and I could go on and on, worldwide places where Christians are going through horrendous treatment and even death. Governments are cracking down on the few churches that are meeting in these countries. Cameramen will show up in a church soon. The police will follow where they arrest the congregation and they harass them. And some they don't ever let go. And they close the church down and permission to reopen it gets lost in the paperwork. And it just, it's just a struggle. But the gospel continues to spread. In Uzbekistan, the, 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 the kind of the, the underlying joke is that the, no one has told the government that the Soviet Union has been dissolved. Because there in Uzbekistan, it's illegal to meet in groups of eight or larger for any reason. Five pastors have been imprisoned uh, for being believers just in the past few years. And, th and the prisons there are not like our prisons by any means. They live in a small, 30, uh, small room with 30 others. They're forbidden to talk about God. They eat rank food. They live in uh, just horrendous living conditions. I won't even go into that. What about here? Are we being persecuted? Some would say that some of the, the, the church shootings are because of persecution. West Paducah, Kentucky. Wedgwood Baptist in Fort Worth. Sutherland Springs. We don't know. Columbine. We know the story of Columbine in Colorado. We too live in a country where Christians are singled out. Persecuted and sometimes even killed. You can expect these things, says Jesus. Now, I want you to connect with the real concern, right? It jumps out of you in verse 10. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. The gospel must first be preached. Why all of the persecution? Because the good news must be preached to all the nations. Here's the spiritual principle. When the gospel is preached, there will be persecution. But the corollary is also true. When there is persecution, the gospel is preached. Persecution accompanies the preaching of the gospel and leads to the preaching of more of the gospel. So where has the gospel, where does it have to be preached? 
to the nations. That's what it says here. To the countries that I've already mentioned. To other countries around the world. And I could go on and on about that. But the gospel also must be preached at home. The gospel must also be preached to your friends. To your co-workers. To your neighbors. It's really not an option. The gospel must be preached to the nations. That's what Jesus said. And that's what he said we should be concerned about. As I was reading through this, I thought of another concern. Another concern comes from uh, where Jesus was um, sending out the 72. Jesus sent out the 72 in, uh, in Luke 10. Luke 10, seven, he sends out the 70, not just his 12, but there's at least, what, 68 other? Am I doing my math right? 68 followers of Jesus that he sends out. 72 of them go out. Okay? And they come back and they're so excited and they're, they're just on fire and they're so hyped up because the, even the spirits, the demons are listening to them and they have authority over them and everything is going great and woohoo! And Jesus says, oh, that's great. But be more concerned, he says, in Luke 10, 20, look it up. Be more concerned as to whether your name is registered in the book of life in heaven. Whoa. So what should we be concerned about? Well, I'm going to say, first of all, that our names, your name, is registered in the book of life. In the Lamb's book of life, as Revelation calls it. Make sure that your name is registered. That you are on the books. How do you get on the books? By receiving Jesus. By living with Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. And then what are you to kind of be concerned about? The end times and all the things that are happening and the famines and the earthquakes and the wars and the rumors of wars? No. Be concerned about the gospel being preached. You see, the church... In Ukraine is no, doing nothing different than it did before the invasion. The church is still doing its thing, doing its main thing. That's proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord. What should the church in America be doing? Proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. Now, I'm not going to say just be flippant about world events. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying don't worry so much about them that you forget the main thing. That our name is written, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, His love, His grace for all people is proclaimed to the nations. Jesus will forever reign. He will. And he already is reigning. And he will forever reign. Where is our concern? Where should we be worrying about? Jesus in another passage says, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you're even going to eat or what you're going to drink or what, how you're going to be clothed or what kind of shelter you're going to have. Worry more about whether you're my child and whether you're living out my plan for your life. Are we doing that? Jesus will forever reign. Let's proclaim him as Lord. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your love, for your grace, for your plan for our lives, for the salvation that is ours through Christ. And I just pray, Lord, that as we prepare for world events, that we will not let them paralyze us and make us fearful and so worried that we cannot move forward and that we cannot move forward with the most important thing, which is to have our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life and to <coughs> proclaim the good news so others can have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Father, we love you. We honor you. We praise you. 
for you forever reign. Teach us what is the most important thing. Guide us to remember what is the most important thing. That our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And that the gospel is to be preached through our lives, to our world, and to all of the world. Go with us now, Lord, I pray with your blessing and with your grace. In the name of Jesus, amen. And amen. God bless you.